you know, the first one is seven trillion. What's this all about anyway? <laughs> Look, uh, as as I'm sure you all know, you shouldn't believe everything you read in the press. Really? Oh. We do think the the kernel of truth is that we do think that uh, investing a lot of money in AI compute energy data centers is going to be important to deliver the the amount of services people want and the tools that we all are going to really, I think, get a huge amount of value out of to help create better futures. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of investment to be made here. I think so. But it's across a lot of stuff. It's not, I mean, it's a, this is like a worldwide investment to help many, many different efforts, many different people, and not just chips, of course, but sort of the whole infrastructure stack around it. Okay, second question. You and I are both tech optimists yeah. a little bit. So why should we be tech optimists about AI? Uh, I mean, I think this is going to be one of the greatest tools humans have yet invented. If, if you think about what we can do with more intelligence available to us, uh, more abundant intelligence, cheaper prices, things that humans on their own are not capable of, uh, we will all be able to invent new things for each other that astonish us. Mm -hmm. That's how the future gets better. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Making things more intelligent. I like it when you say that. Uh, third question. Uh, you know, our founder... Andy Grove famously said, the paranoid survive, right? Paranoid about yourself, your success, but also paranoid about competition and things that could go wrong. And there are those who are a little bit paranoid about AI today. What do you say to them? I think people are right to be cautious about AI. Uh, I think that this is, I think this is gonna be an extraordinarily powerful technology. I think it's gonna reshape significant parts of the way we live and work and that our economy runs and Part of our strategy, what we call iterative deployment, is that we want to put these things out into the world early so that people can adapt and think and provide input and that uh, we can be ready for the magnitude of change that will come over time. Mm -hmm. So I think that's great. Moore's Law, alive and well. Until the periodic table is exhausted, we're not done with Moore's Law. We bend physics, we create molecules, we do amazing things, and Moore's Law is alive and well. But we have to do it a different way. We have to enable globally resilient, sustainable, and trusted supply chains. And at the end of our conference today, I'm joined by uh, Sam Altman, and he's gonna challenge the capacity needs of the industry. And the system of chips needs new capabilities, new tests, advanced and packaging capabilities, and that's what a systems foundry does. And as we describe this vision to become the number two foundry of the world, we realize there's only a few companies that can do this that have the capital capacity, that have the R&D, the longevity to go do this. And now as we're in an economic downturn, ah, welcome the semiconductors. And then the AI explosion and the cyclicality of the industry. And we've seen the geo instability and active wars in Israel and Ukraine and the tensions in Taiwan Straits. This is anything but a resilient supply chain today. And for that, we get to be a large, meaningful, the second largest foundry but become the world's most sustainable foundry, the world's most resilient foundry, because that's exactly what the world requires. But stunningly, you know, in 1990, 80% of the semiconductors were built in US and Europe. Today, 80% in a small concentrated area in Asia. You know, we've seen this long, steady decline, right, in terms of our supply chains for the world. Nothing should be reliant on a single port, a single country, a single place in the world. We need resilience, ac resilient access to supply chains and capacity in the right regions at the right time. And thus, the choice, the opportunity to drive systemic change in where and how we drive the most important aspect of our future, where the technology supply chains are. What aspect of your life is not becoming more digital? Well, everything is, your healthcare, your financial, your social. And with that, we simply call it siliconomy. Silicon and the economy becoming fused together in an inextricable way. And as stewards of Moore's Law, we see this relentless pursuit of more efficient, more capable, more scalable computing. And for that, we've been on this journey. We also announced that we're gonna get five nodes in four years. We're gonna do something unheard of in the industry to return Intel to process technology leadership. And while we're not finished today, 
we see the end is soon in front of us on that journey. And Intel 7, shipping and ramping in volume. Intel 4 with our core ultra launch, shipping and ramping in volume. Intel 3 is production certified and will be with our server products uh, launching in the first half of the year, going into volume production. So with this, we've gone on an incredible journey, but then it continues into what we call the angstrom era. And for this, Intel 20A and Intel 18A, the adoption of ribbon fed, a new transistor structure of power via power delivery technology, the embrace of the first major new transistor re-architecting since 12. This is a Mona Lisa. No, no, this is a Rembrandt. No, no, no. I think it's a Michelangelo, right? Sculpted in silicon, right? For these truly are works of art. And I am thrilled for the progress. And with that, the finish is 18A. We've already sent into FAB our first 18A products. And this is a test chip for Clearwater Forest. So I am thrilled. This is what we call a family photo. So kids, come to Papa. Here we go, five nodes in four years. And I do want to announce, describe, and give a moment to our latest newest 18A customer, my decades-long friend, Satya Nadella, speaking for Microsoft as the newest 18A customer. So let's hear from Satya now. Thank you so much, Pat. It's great to join you at your launch event. It's clear that we are in the midst of a very exciting platform shift that will fundamentally transform productivity for every individual organization and the entire industry. Uh, to achieve this vision, we will need a reliable supply of the most advanced high performance and high quality semiconductors. And all of us at Microsoft are committed to supporting Intel's efforts to build a strong supply chain right here in the United States. That's why we are so excited to work with Intel Foundry Services and why we have chosen a chip design that we plan to produce on Intel's 18A process. Uh, we look forward to sharing more details in the future and I can't wait to see all that we will be delivering together for our customers in the years ahead. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Sacha. So, can I tell you more about what comes after 18A? Today, we're announcing that we're extending these nodes. We're adding major and minor uh, nodes to it, a combination of older and leading edge nodes to ensure our customers have access to the process technology they need. Today, we are announcing Intel 14A for the first time. You think about this like 1.4 nanometer technology, but Intel 14A venturing deeply into the angstrom era. 14A, first processor. Unit. But we're also announcing that we're extending our nodes, as you see on here, adding P nodes, enhancements to those existing, adding performance capabilities, adding T nodes uh, through Silicon Via, new feature enhancements with E nodes on the roadmap, filling out that roadmap of capability. Today, we're announcing for the first time Intel 16E, enhancements to our Intel 16 technology as well. So we're filling out that full set of nodes and the roadmap that we have to go beyond it. But as we've seen as we've gone through this period of time, this AI era explosion, wafers are cool, packaging has gotten to be really cool. So Intel Foundry offers a, a broad set now of advanced assembly and test uh, technologies. Intel 25 years ago drove the standardization of organic packages. Now we're driving the next generation of glass based packages, and with that, the ability to directly interface with optics and waveguides directly into the package construct for the most advanced system capabilities as well. You know, an Intel Foundry has added a number of additional AI uh, customers to our portfolio of packaging offerings as well. AI era needs advanced wafers, but it even needs more systems and packaging capabilities, an area that Intel is the clear leader in. And this now includes, as customers, some of the largest AI leaders in the world. As I conclude my time on stage, today is a day three years in the making. And I couldn't be prouder of the team at Intel that has rallied behind this rebuilding of this iconic company. And you're gonna hear from a number of those leaders today bringing together the world's first system foundry capabilities for the AI era. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce to the stage a friend for decades now and the zealous leader of our foundry services, none other than Stu Pant. Please welcome Stu to the stage. Our people can sense and feel this momentum. 
You can hear it in their voices. You can see it in their actions. They know that you don't need to be in Taiwan to build the world's most advanced semiconductors. They've realized this five nodes in four years, this audacious goal that Pat laid out. You can see the check marks across all the boxes here. We're ready to earn the right to be your foundry supplier. Nobody's going to give us that. We want to earn it. So that's one perspective. I want to offer up a second perspective. And this comes from Chris Miller, the author of the book Chip War. This is a New York Times bestseller, Financial Times Book of the Year. It took Chris 10 years to write it. Now, Chris, in a speech in October, said this quote to the employees. He said, quote, unquote, Intel is the most important company of the last 50 years. So I called Chris and I said, are you okay if I say this publicly? He said, yeah, okay, go ahead. Good publicity for the book. I came back to Intel three months after Pat did because I believe this quote to be true. And I believed it long before Chris said it. And what you're going to hear in the next 40 minutes or so is all the reasons why Chip War Season 2 is about to begin. So let's start from the beginning. Gordon's original paper was called Cramming More Components on Integrated Circuits. It was published in 1965. Every time I read it, I'm stunned by how pressing he was. In the last section of the paper, Gordon remarks, we've come to a day of reckoning. Quote, unquote, it may prove to be more economical to build large systems out of smaller functions, which are separately packaged and interconnected. And this is why I believe we're in the area of the systems boundary. You can no longer do just monolithic devices. You have to break it up. You have to adjust for thermal profiles. You have to address costs. You have to have flexibility. And this is all driving a new level of systems thinking into the foundry business. In this systems era, you not only have to have open standards between devices, you have to have standards on the device. Think about the fact of to do a training model day requires 100,000 CPUs, all running in concert, all on the same data set. The next round of training models will require a million CPUs. That's something that requires standards everywhere, from chips inside to chips outside. This is what's necessary for our customers to succeed, and this is the fundamental reason why Intel is a systems company turning into a foundry, not the other way around. So now that we've described system thinking, let's look at how the original foundry model was created. Now, since CC Way has been kind enough to mention us in his last few earnings calls, I thought I'd return the favor and talk about TSMC in my presentation. Now, this was a presentation that Morris Chang gave at MIT last October. In it, he describes the foundry model. He says it's research and development, it's wafer fabrication, it's advanced packaging. And he says, in the red line, that's what TSMC does. And he said, in the blue line, Intel or everybody else does everything else. You might even call that an IDM 1.0 kind of manufacturer. Now, TSMC has been incredibly successful with this model. Discipline execution, discipline strategy, consistent innovation. But to quote Bob Dylan, the times, they are changing. <laughs> Let me tell you why. This, there's the idea of systems technology co-optimization, where you look at application workloads, software, system architecture, memory interconnect, all these different things. What happens today is people focus on their layer and maybe the layer up on top of it. And in fact, this is really what a classic foundry does today. But we're now in the realm of the exponential. Sam Altman is going to come out later on this afternoon and talk about he doesn't have enough capacity to do what he wants to do. You have to look at all of these combinations. You can get a couple of things right, but to do a system that coordinates the activities of solving a training model across 100,000 CPUs requires you to get all the gear ratios right. If you're mismatched in memory, if you're mismatched in networking, you wind up throwing away valuable cycles and valuable resources. So we've got to get 100x more out of what we're doing. So we described the evolution. Now let's build out the strategy and talk about what's the revolution in all of this. We like to think about this in three basic layers. First off, we have to be a world-class foundry. Right? Rowan Chen, the CEO of Qualcomm, talks about the fact that Silicon speaks and Silicon speaks in four different ways. Performance, power, area, and cost. Without that, you're not in the business. The next layer of the pyramid is all about resilient, sustainable supply. This need to have capability around the world to build this and to build it in a sustainable fashion. The top layer of the pyramid is this idea of systems of chips. We're putting system inside a chip 
and we're working with our foundry partners to create systems of chips. So let's walk you through what that means. Now, I talked earlier about this day of reckoning, what that means. It's happening now. We can no longer do designs at a monolithic level. We are now at reticle limited designs, design sizes that are 800 square millimeters of silicon, because we have to move beyond, rec beyond reticle limits and thermal constraints, and by the way, even cost constraints, because when you're building these really big die sizes, they're really expensive. Isn't there a better way to take advantage, as Pat talked about, to take smaller tiles on the more advanced nodes, get better yields out of them, package them together, have more flexibility? To do all that really requires, if you will, a system on a chip. So you can see in the animation here how we build it out. And this is literally how we're going to build out in the factory. The idea of a substrate, the idea of base dies, the idea of logic tiles, the idea of I.O. tiles on the side. Why do this? It gives our customers the ability to optimally trade for what they need for their design. The things that you do for a training engine will be different than what you do for an inference engine. And only by having all these levers to go pull can you get this done. We learned a lot through a device called Pontevecchio, or as the branding people call it, Intel Data Center GPU Max Series. It's an SOC. It's a 100 billion transistor SOC. It's dozens of chiplet tiles, 47 of them. It's multiple suppliers. By the way, we coexist with TSMC in the same package. Right? We develop testing techniques to go off and do that. We do this idea of singulated die test. What does that mean? It means every single die that goes into that package is a known good die. Why is that important? Because you want every one of them to be good. The assembly test yield on this device is 95% plus. It is the Super Bowl of integrated design. Now, what do you do with it? Well, if you're Argonne National Labs and our partners at HPE, you build a really big supercomputer. And they built a computer that was 66,000 Pontevecchios, 20,000 Sapphire Rapids. And it looks like this. OK, what do you do with something like that? Well, you solve some really hard science problems. If you want to model the airflow across a wing, you can do that on a workstation. If you want to model the airflow across a plane, you do it on this. If you want to model fusion reactions, which are pretty tricky things to model. You do it on a device like this. If you want to model, if you want to model cancer curing drugs at the molecular level, you do it like this. It's 600 tons of compute. It's four tennis courts. It is the weight of an Airbus. It has 300 miles of optical cable. It takes 34,000 gallons a minute to cool. By the way, your faucet at home, the gallon a minute. 34,000 gallons a minute. So when we talk about how to design this stuff, we have to find ways to make this more power efficient, to make this more cost effective. This today is the second fastest supercomputer in the world. By the way, at 100,000 CPUs roughly, to handle the demands of AI, we're going to go far beyond that. And that's why this idea of scalability is so important. Now, let's go through the top of the pyramid, this idea of systems of chip. Systems of chip requires, Pat mentioned, great packaging technology. We've created standard called UCIE, which allows chip-to-chip -chip connectivity. Think of it as the PCI Express of what we did back in the mid-90s, this idea that you can add mix and match. By the way, you can mix and match different foundry suppliers. We like that because we're sort of an underdog in all this. Some of our competitors, not so much. But our customers want this kind of flexibility. So as you can see from the rendering, what we're doing is taking systems on a chip and building systems of chips. Why do you need systems of chips? Because it's the same problem I mentioned earlier. You need to train models with 100,000 CPUs now and a million potentially down the road, and then maybe up to 10 million. When you're moving and coordinating data across all of these devices, you need to have standards and connectivity, and that's what we provide. And really, when you think about it, what is, what's it going to take to bring AI everywhere? How do you make it cost effective? How do you make it capital efficient? Yes, yeah, I know Sam's asking for trillions, but we want to make sure he's spending all that money in the most cost-effective manner possible. So let's break that out. You have data center chips doubling year on year, but the efficiency needs are the things that are really eye-catching. New York Times ran an article that AI could soon need as much electricity as an entire country. So I'm sure you're curious, like which countries? Sweden, the Netherlands, Argentina. If you were to run all of the AI servers that market estimates have on DGX2, DX100, those kind of devices, you would take 85 to 134 terawatt 
hours, terawatt hours. By the way, the great state of California, its entire power generation capability today is 30 terawatt hours for the entire state. So bringing AI everywhere is going to require us and our foundry partners to figure out how to do this cost effectively. This is what this roadmap is going to take. And this, I think, is what makes us different than other foundry approaches. You have to start off cross, first off with table stakes. Right? As I mentioned, you have to start off with a great process. Add to that packaging, which is, we believe, a unique differentiator for us. Why? We build a lot of server parts. And we're taking everything that we learn from our server business and offering up to our foundry partners. These are table stakes, and this is what it takes to be a foundry player. We have this planned out literally across all these dimensions for the next five years. Let's talk about cooling. I mentioned that that's Argon needs 34,000 gallons a minute to cool it off. The next wave of devices are going to have to be immersion cooled. And today, Intel's Xeon product line is the only product that offers an immersion cooling warranty. Immersion cooling allows us to deliver power much more effectively in a data center. We're going to take what we've learned there, and we're going to offer that up to our Foundry customers so that when we start looking at 2,000 watt devices five years from now, we're going to have a way to cool those. Memory. How do perhaps do we put memory on the device itself so it's more computationally cost effective? And over the next five years, you're going to hear us talk a lot about new technologies and new ways to increase memory bandwidth while decreasing the need for energy consumption. A five year kind of look. Interconnects. Interconnects between chips, the idea of having high speed certies, high speed interconnect, all the things that you expect from a foundry provider is what we're going to give you, and we're going to not plan out for just what's out there today. Keep in mind, as a standards company, we do this across all different standards, and it's our job to make those standards available to all of you. And last, you know, networking. Think about a NIC card that's capable of handling demands of AI modeling. What you do with Ethernet today isn't good enough. So we're working closely with a number of Ethernet standards partners to figure out ways, how do we make Ethernet more capable to develop the idea of systems of chips. And Ethernet provides that low-cost, high-bandwidth potential to go off and do that. Add to that photonics. Add to that technologies beyond that. Here again, it's another five-year roadmap. This morning, we're announcing a new partnership with ARM, Merging Business Initiative. How do we take advantage of all the programs that ARM has to offer to bring design capability, design education out to all of their customers? We're doing this with ARM. We will make co-investments. We'll do joint programs, we'll provide shuttles at scale, ARM will provide IP at scale, and this is how we're going to fuel this next wave of innovation. And it's truly exciting. So what I'd like to do now is invite Rain to come up on stage with me. Hello, sir. So good to have you here. So, Renee, first off, in what kind of universe would you have ever thought that you'd see ARM and Intel standing together? But you know, we rapidly came to the realization that 80% of the wafers TSMC runs has an ARM device in them. There is no way you can be in the foundry business without a partnership with ARM. And I think you'd like to probably tell us about a few of them, starting with perhaps the announcements you made this morning. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. As you said, this is a, a bit of strange bedfellows. I was trying to think of a parallel that I might give I relative to the story. And the <laughs> only thing I could kind of think of is when Walt Mossberg asked Steve Jobs what it was like to see iTunes run on Windows. And I think he said it was like an ice water in hell, but I won't go that far. <laughs> I won't go that far. The announcements that we made earlier today was around our Neoverse product line, which is the product line that we use for the data center, which has just been exploding. It was in a very, very high growth trajectory prior to the AI wave, and now it's become even stronger. The Neoverse V3 that we announced today, which is 50% faster than the Neoverse N2, and then our N3 Neoverse, which is 20% faster, but also much more efficient. And when you think about these AI data centers, which are pulling hundreds of megawatts and, and more, efficiency matters. So yeah, today was a big day for ARM. We're working on, on, on cutting edge technology. When you talk about 18A and, and system foundry and the packaging, this is uh, the tip of the spear in terms of innovation. And you guys have been terrific. Uh, it has been an absolute joy to work with your groups. The level of engineering engagement, the depth of the technical discussions, uh, the information that we get, uh, we would not be able to announce the partnership that we've forged without it. We talked a little bit about Faraday 
Let's talk a little bit about what the role Faraday plays in Neoverse and CSS, and why, what, maybe to find for the audience, what is CSS and yep. why is it so important yep. for everybody here in the audience? Yeah, so we announced uh, a new strategy some months ago around what we call compute subsystems. And the way to think about this is essentially, rather than ARM delivering blocks of IP, uh, a mesh network, a memory controller, the CPUs themselves, we deliver a full subsystem, fully verified, completed. That is, if you want 64 cores, 96 cores, 128 cores for a CPU, we deliver everything in terms of that system, validated, verified, and it will work. Now, one of the big benefits of this is simply the fact that time waits for no one, the classic, the classic quote. The amount of time it takes to design these SOCs is really, really hard, and it's really, really long. If we're delivering final IP to a customer, they still need to put all those pieces together. If we can put all of that together for them prior, at the same date they would have got the block of IP, that's a huge, huge benefit. And then when you add on to it, the processing cycle times that are getting longer and longer, I know you guys are doing your best, we are. but you know, more EUV steps means more complex time through the fab. And that just means that ultimately the processing times are long, you have complex packaging, you know, that adds a lot of time. So anything you can do on the front end to benefit the design time is, is really beneficial. So we announced this program called uh, ARM Total Design, of which Intel is a partner. And in that model, customers can come to their partners and work with those folks to get their design out. And that's what Faraday is. So Faraday is basically doing that. They'll be able to put their IP together with our blocks and something that just, end quote, works. And everyone wins. The product's out faster, it's compliant, and it's going to work. Outstanding. Well, Renee, thank you for coming and joining us on stage today. My pleasure. Totally appreciate the partnership and everything we're doing together Lucky and everything day. we're going to do together. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again. again. Thanks all. So to finish out my talk, I'd like to go back to where I started. This is an ad rolled at the Super Bowl, 1997, the year the Green Bay Packers beat the Patriots. The halftime show was the Blues Brothers and James Brown and it was eight years after Taylor Swift was born. <laughs> I had to do it. You can't associate Super Bowls without Taylor Swift. And this commercial was iconic. But you know, things have changed a lot over the last several years, and that change is only going to accelerate as AI impacts your work, your business, your life. How AI has impacted the design cycle, how AI improves the capability for your engineers to do so much more with so much less effort. So what we decided to do with this commercial was take a generative AI view of it. So this commercial, nobody people were harmed. We did 100% AI rendered. It was done by a very creative director, Dave Clark, out of Los Angeles. And he's a big advocate of using AI tools not to take away creativity, but to amplify creativity. So as you leave our session today, remember this, that the only limitation to what we can do with AI is your imagination. Thank you.